Here we go. With the, I, I put it as bleeding yeast and death plants, but he reversed it on me, just to keep me on my toes, I guess. So here's Edward Marcotte is going to talk about how you can study genes in one organism that are also found in other organisms, like genes and yeast that are also found in people. Hey. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, can, you, can you hear me okay with the mic on? Is this too loud? Because I can turn it down if it's too loud. I tend to talk loud. It is too loud. Okay. Uh, no? No? <laughs> she says it's too loud. I believe her. Um, adjust volume. Alright, so let's try this and we'll see how it goes. Alright, is that a little bit better? Still too loud? Okay. Um, well, so um, today I'm going to tell you um, about some of the work that we do. I'm a professor at the University of Texas, and I run a laboratory there where we use evolution to learn about human disease. And we try to develop drugs for, among other things, uh, cancer. And we, we study the genetics of birth defects and many other kinds of genetic diseases in people. But we do these studies in yeast, and plants, and worms, and things that you would think have really no basis for being sort of useful in that capacity, but they actually turn out to be incredibly useful. So I'm going to tell you about some of this work um, that exploits evolution to do medicine, basically, or at least sort of early on in the stages. Um, a lot of what you'll see is work done in my laboratory, but I can do it all. Um, this is work of PhD students and postdocs in my laboratory and in uh, collaborators around the world. And the bits I'll touch on today, I've listed various people up here, but you should keep in the back of your mind that science is a collaborative discipline with um, lots of contributions. And so there's, I have collaborators in Seoul and in uh, University of California, Davis, and Stanford, and Toronto, and Barcelona. Um, that have all, and uh, we've worked jointly on the work that you'll see here. Okay. So, um, I should also say that feel free to interrupt me at any time. I don't mind in the slightest. If something isn't clear, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll try to clarify right then. Because if, if it's unclear to you, it's probably unclear to somebody else. So don't hesitate to ask questions. Okay. So we'll start off with uh, a pop quiz. Get you on your toes. Um, so we've sequenced the human genome. We're going to hear a lot about genomes uh, in this uh, talk. And we're going to talk about genetics, which is sort of understanding how our genomes are different and how that impacts disease and so on. So the first human genome was a billion dollar project. And it took 10 years, and it took a tremendous number of laboratories all around the world contributing into it. Uh, cost has now dropped by 10, 100,000, 100,000, a billion? I know she knows. What do you think? It's my wife. Uh, any guesses? What, uh, a million. A million. What do we got? 100,000. 100,000. I guessed a million. You guessed a million. All right. You're all down in the bottom down here. Nobody guesses 10? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah, well, you're right. So it's a million and drop it. Um, so it cost a billion dollars in a decade. Now it takes a couple of days, and we do it for $1,000, and the price is dropping um, at a staggering, it's actually faster in computing. If you've ever heard of Moore's Law, which is how semiconductors get smaller and smaller, and computers get more powerful, this is faster than Moore's Law. It's outpacing the rate of computing, the ability to sequence DNA and get a complete genome sequence. All of the A, T, Cs, and Gs that make up your DNA, and get the genetic instructions to make an organism. So it takes us a few days. We have uh, in the attic of my building, we've got a bunch of machines that'll do it. We do it regularly. Um, there's now projects doing thousands of genomes. They actually just launched the 3 million genome project uh, in China. And there's a competing one uh, throughout the US and Europe uh, to sequence a million uh, genomes of organisms. So it's sort of staggering. So we can go through and we can read the DNA that makes up the genome of an organism. But the real challenge now is no longer sequencing the genome, it's interpreting that and figuring out what the differences among individuals mean and how that translates into changes in health and so on. So 
The catch is, is that in your genome, in the human genome, so there's three billion letters, it's quite long, A, C's, T's, and G's, and there's differences among us, and within that you have about 20,000 genes, and um, all of us are a little bit different, you know, we're 99 plus percent identical, but, uh, but there's little differences here and there, and our ability to understand the consequences of those changes is still pretty slim. Um, and this is now one of the big focuses of biology, is trying to understand what the differences mean and how that makes some of us more susceptible to heart disease or high cholesterol or diabetes. Or um, so we need to do this. There's sort of uh, huge investments worldwide in how to do this, and the technologies are really amazing. So for example, um, we can now sequence the genome of a fetus before it's born. And we can do that without ever touching the fetus just because the baby's DNA is in the mom's bloodstream free. And from blood of the mother, we can now diagnose things like Down syndrome without ever getting amniocentesis on the baby. Um, there's a tremendous investment in trying to understand um, genomes and to be able to look at, at all of this. All right. So this is the space that we work in. We try to interpret the genome. We, we take the fact that we know genome sequences, we know what your genes are, we know what some of them do in great detail. More than half of them, we have only the most approximate notion of what those genes are doing. So think of it like, uh, you know, sort of the first discovery of a new continent or something. We have tremendous, we know it's there, <laughs> we know the bounds of it, um, but there's tremendous amount of unknown material in it, unknown places in it, that we're trying to understand um, their properties. So the way that we approach this, and that, that a number of biologists approach this, is to take advantage of evolution and the fact that that living things all share a common ancestor. We're all cousins of every other living thing in the world, very distant cousins. Um, and what that means is that in your cells, um, the DNA of yeast and worm and frog and so on is, has very recognizable equivalences to the human uh, DNA, um, some parts more than others. And we can leverage that information to learn about the human genome and human disease. So, Pretty much every genetic disease and trait we know of impacts systems that have equivalences in other species. Um, it's actually very, very difficult to find any examples that don't. And all of the genetic traits that we know of then are affecting these systems that are shared with very different creatures. And so in my laboratory, we use sort of this combination of all sorts of different techniques like biochemistry and genetics and computer modeling and there's a new field well, systems in synthetic biology trying to take the disciplines like biochemistry and automate them so that instead of doing one experiment, we do thousands of experiments at a time using robots and computers to monitor it and so on. And we try to understand this process. Um, if you've never seen a kind of a working uh, laboratory of this sort, you know, this is the, so these are some snapshots from around the lab and down the hall of, of people working on growing uh, organisms dishes and manipulating DNA and uh, extremely powerful microscopes that we can see single molecules. We have uh, a lot of sort of heavy equipment for carving up cells and the parts and analyzing them and just a tremendous amount of computing, <laughs> keeping up with the literature. We always tease Taijin because of this. Uh, this, is, this is about a quarter of the papers that are actually stacked on this desk. The rest wraps around the, the side there. <laughs> okay, so our lab generates a lot of data about what genes do, and so does a thousand other labs around the world. This is a worldwide endeavor. Everybody's studying different sets of genes. And so what that means is that across all the genes in the human genome and many other species, we now have millions and millions of experimental observations. So if you think about somebody going in and doing one study and learning about exactly how these molecules work in a cell, and now think of that a million times over. That's the sort of the depth of information we have. And so we have all these different measurements about when genes are active. They don't, they're not just passive. They, genes are often the instructions to make other molecules in your cell, like proteins and RNAs. And they have to get turned on and off. So there's switches to control them. And we can now measure across the entire human genome which genes are turned on and off at any particular time. And we can see where they are and how they interact with each other. We can do this in mice and yeast 
And one of the popular systems is little worms and frogs and so on. So we have this sort of incredible depth of information. So what I'll try to do over the next couple of slides is I'll give you a sense for how do you cope with the onslaught of all of this, and then we're going to see how this all turns out to depend completely on, on evolution for us to do our work. Um, so the big notion here is we have 20,000 genes. We want to figure out how they work together. And we want to leverage that information to learn about well, which ones are important for heart disease, which ones are important for diabetes, and so on. So what proportion of genes are like, well understood? Yeah, less than a quarter. So the question is how many genes do you really understand well? And it's certainly less than a quarter. Half of them really only the vaguest notion. Um, all right, so let's see. One of the powerful tools that we have that we use uh, regularly is if you think about something like the internet or Facebook. Facebook is a map of who knows each other, right? So you have your friends, and your friends have their friends, and their friends have their friends. That's actually a network of interrelationships of humans. And it says something about which people know each other, which people work together. It reflects kind of the functioning of society in some weird way. The internet, of course, has links between sites. It's the store of non interconnected knowledge. We try to build this sort of knowledge base for your genes. If you have 20,000 genes, all of these kinds of experiments around the world, millions of observations, are now reside in computer models that talk about which genes work together in different cells and different contexts. So these two genes do something, and they make two molecules, and those molecules bind each other to do something in a cell. They get connected in a network, in a computer model. And this computer model is a little tiny sort of drawings of models there, but in fact, this is a vast, vast model. These models now exist to capture the existing data of what we know in biology about how the genes work together in a sort of a synthesis of all of that information. What does that look like? These are complicated models. Um, we've actually tried to draw what these relationships look like. So imagine for a minute trying to draw the internet. Right? That's hard, because it's just unfathomably big. Actually, 10 years ago, you could draw the internet. Um, I think it'd be hard for us to do it now. But we've, we've developed computer programs that try to draw the gene network. And this is an example of one of these, where every place you see a little vertex represents a gene. And wherever there's a line connecting two vertices, that's where there's experimental evidence that those genes work together. And this is a synthesis. This is actually all the genes of the mustard plant, the Rabidopsis. Yeah? What do you think colors represent? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so when we draw these pictures, we often use different colors for all sorts of different things. And I actually can't remember what they are in that particular <laughs> picture. Uh, but examples would be, it might be the kind of genes they are, like whether they're involved in a cellular process or cell-cell processes, or whether they're whether uh, you know certain categories of genes or something. So we can color them however we want, and we try to we try to place them. We try to draw the pictures so the ones that are connected are close. And you'll notice it's clumpy. So this set of genes right here work together intimately to do something. We may or may not know what that something is, but we know they work together from experiments. And when we synthesize this data from a thousand labs around the world, this is the sort of level that we get to. Yeah. And also, how do you know where to place it? Ooh, that's a good question. How do we draw the picture? So that was the whole secret: was how do you how do you take something as complicated as you know Facebook or something like that and draw a picture of it? And what we actually do is we start in the middle and we take the ones that they're connected to and we pretend that the connections are springs. And in the computer, we simulate them springing around until they're all kind of as close as they can be, just like they were little springs. And then we fix those, and we add the next layer, and they spring around in the next layer, and we lay it out from the middle out, it's kind of like unfolding this picture to draw a picture. Okay. So this, this actually, this way of drawing a large graph was, was really um, very powerful for getting an idea of what was going on. Um, and in fact, um, our program, if you just as an aside, has now been picked up and used by many people. Um, and if you happen to see this issue of National Geographic on the newsstands over the past year or so, um, that drawing of the internet was made with our software, actually. Um, so our software is now the one used to draw so pictures. Is that uh, this is our drawing back here. So yes. So it was in the 
Oh, <laughs> there's no way I'm going to be able to find a particular thing within that. Um, but it, it does exist in there someplace, and we can find it, um, but not the D by I. Um, but anyway, this is, these turn out to be very general ways. We've been contacted by many groups looking at cell phone connectivity networks and things like that to draw pictures of them. Steve? What are the outliers? Yeah, so these are the ones that it's very clear. We have a set of genes working together, but we don't have any evidence for who they work with. So we know that they're working together, but we have no connections to anything else right now. There's a, what happens is we have very limited knowledge. I think these, that map has on the order of 20 or 30 or 40 million experimental observations in it, but we still have very limited knowledge of the complexity of the genes. Um, just another aside, when we, when we developed these algorithms, we drew lots of pretty pictures. And this one was one showing the evolutionary relationships among genes. Each of these blocks is now genes from different organisms, and we're looking at which ones are related across organisms. And it's in sort of a beautiful graph. Here the color is just actually just the order we drew them from the center outward, but it's very pretty. And it was so pretty that a curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York liked it, and they've actually acquired it for their permanent collection. Now. So this is in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was exhibited there uh, in a really fun exhibit called Design of the Elastic Mind. If you like science pictures, there's a website with great science pictures on it. All sorts of crazy design centers. Okay. So how do we use this? This is our attempt to capture knowledge. Now what we, we have a goal. We want to find genes that cause important diseases. And the way we do this is we just look at their friends. So you can poke your Facebook friends, right? So if we have a set of genes like these blue ones that are linked to a disease, like heart disease or a particular birth defect or something like that, their friends in these graphs are highly likely to be involved in the same disease. So it's just, who do you know, and check them first. And that actually turns out to be very simple and incredibly powerful. Because you have the full synthesis of knowledge up to that point that you've been able to capture. And now you can go hunting for new instances. And we've, and other groups have tested this now in many, many cases. And I'll just give you a few cases to give you a glimpse of how this works. But we've done this in more than 300 cases now where we would have a set of genes that had an activity we were really interested in, and we would go find new genes that were required and necessary and useful for that activity. So I just showed two pictures here. This is a little nematode. Um, it's only about a millimeter long. It's called C. elegans. And this is one of the classic systems that biologists often study because it only has a thousand cells. And it has about um, you know, a few hundred neurons, and we know how they're all connected. And so it's a pretty simple model of the nervous system that people study. And the two bumps on this one is that if you, if it has certain mutations, a couple of genes, actually the genes that cause a form of eye cancer in humans called retinoblastoma, then the worms get worm tumors. Not exactly tumors in the way the humans are, but it turns out to be the same molecular machines involved, same sets of genes working together. And in this case, we wanted to find genes that you could target with a drug to cure worms of these simple model tumors. And we were able to use these network models to actually find a handful of genes that in worms that would develop these, if we, if we target these with a, with a drug, in this case a genetic drug that allows us to specifically turn off just one gene that we've chosen, then now we get worms without these. Now that is actually a human tumor gene in the same um, system here, and we don't know if targeting that gene in a human would help in the case of an eye tumor. But that's one of the motivations for doing this, is that, that we, we, as we start learning more about those systems, we're, we're hoping that that basic biology will translate into uh, more useful things. Here's a second example. This is a little mustard plant, and so you can see its roots. It's not, it would be normally be growing in soil, but now it's laid out flat. And you can see its roots have these long tap roots and these little lateral roots hanging off. And using these network models, there was a gene that nobody knew anything about, but it was connected up to root formation genes, and so we had a pretty good clue it would be involved in root formation. And the power of modern biology now is that for any one of the 20,000 genes, same in a plant or a worm or in us, we can go in and precisely change it and nothing else. And in this case, if we just interrupt this gene in the plant, 
we get plants without lateral roots. And if we just give them this gene back as a piece of DNA, we can turn them back on again. So we can turn it on and off whether these plants form these lateral roots by manipulating this gene. We've discovered a toggle switch for turning on and off the production of these roots. So that's sort of an example of the precision that sometimes we can get using these kind of models that we're talking about. Um, all right, so these are very basic ideas. Is this useful for anything sort of larger? Can we, can we apply this to things that, you know, matter? How are you able to have that great precision? How can you get a good yeah. precision to be able to put so, DNA into a cell? Well, so DNA is like an alphabet. And um, if you looked in a book, you could find a, a, a sentence that only occurred one time in that entire book, right? And so if I said, go do something where this sentence is, you know exactly, out of an entire book, you know exactly where to go. And it's the same in your DNA. DNA is an alphabet, it only has four letters, A, C, T, and G, but you can, you can make um, molecular tools that go in, and they can now go to a very precise location, and they can change right there. And this is one of the great breakthroughs in biology. Yeah, so in this particular one, we're taking advantage of the fact that there are parasites that live in DNA. There are pieces of DNA that copy themselves and infect other pieces of DNA. And we've actually stuck one of those into the middle of this gene. So we're using a natural process, an infection with a DNA parasite in a particular gene to turn it off. And we give it back the gene to turn it back on. That's a great question. So, um, right, so we just can do useful things with this. We try. Um, one of the places that we've been trying to use this is in rice. So rice feeds half the world. Um, Two billion people worldwide, it's the main food staple, and diseases like rice blight actually destroy um, a significant fraction, up to half of the crops a year, the yield a year, is lost to bacterial infections like rice blight, where the normal healthy rice is then got some infected blight and it's uh, um, devastating uh, to the crops and the people that would be eating it. And we've been working with researchers in the University of California, Davis, to look at um, the genes involved in resisting rice blight. The ideal case would be if we had rice that was resistant to rice blight, and we could now feed a much more substantial fraction of the world. Um, and these are some rice stalks, and what you see is, here's the rice stalk, and all that yellow is when they were infected with the rice blight at the tip, and the infection, that yellowing spread all the way down. So if you do it on regular rice, then this is uh, what happens. Now, this is a resistant stalk. This is actually an interesting story. This is, a, this is actually a GMO rice. There's one gene you can add to all the standard rice stuff. This is called Katake rice. You can add exactly one gene, and you can get a rice that's mostly resistant. But of course, it's a GMO, and there's a great deal of regulation on the release of GMO. So this is not grown in the wild. But we would like to know how it works. And so if we now go through and use these gene network models, we can find genes that it works with. And in this one, if we just turn off one of these genes, like we did in the other case, now it's no longer resistant again. So we know that the second gene is required for the resistance. So this is now a native rice gene that we know is important for rice resistance. And we actually have many of these that both turn it up and turn it down. And so this is an example of very precision genetics. We're trying to get in and understand these systems with the hope that this can be used in some sort of targeted breeding or something like that to build more resistant rice stocks. And the other place is that, yeah, go ahead. That's an excellent question. And that's actually how we've gotten some other kinds of important rice, like rice that survives flooding for weeks, was from naturally occurring mutations. This one turns out to be kind of far. It would be hard for this normal rice to mutate to that, but that's a good idea. One of the other places we've looked, and I apologize, this is just maybe a tiny bit gruesome, 
is looking at birth defects. You know, one in every thousand children is born with some sort of congenital birth defect. And these are mice, not, not baby humans, but baby mice. But these network approaches have proved incredibly powerful at discovering the genetics of birth defects. And this particular mouse right here has a mutation in a gene that has a very friendly name, Fuzzy. Um, but in fact, um, it ends up with extra fingers and all sorts of things. And the network models have now helped us really understand the genetics and discover a great number of new birth defect genes, especially around diseases like spinal cord. Okay. Now what I haven't told you, I've shown you these examples, but the key to all of these working, and the reason I'm telling you this uh, on a Darwin day, is that the way we've done this is perhaps surprising. <clears throat> we are not just looking at the genes of the mice and the rice and the other animals. Um, we're actually using data from all across life in these models. So here's an example where these are little seedlings, and they're nice dark green like they should be. It's the first few leaves of cotyledon and the developing mustard plants. And all of these ones over here have different genes affected, and they change their color. We were hunting for genes that were involved in pigmentation of the cotyledons. And so these are all successful ones where we know that these genes are involved. And again, we use the sort of Facebook-style gene network to do this, but the connections between the genes actually came from animals and fungus, right? And animals don't have seedlings, they don't have leaves, at least the last time I checked, no leaves, um, they're not green, but they actually have the same molecular machines in their cells, often used for different purposes, at least to an extent that we can leverage that data and use it. So all of those predictions were made because of these evolutionary relationships. And all the other models, the birth defect genes that we're getting, many of those came from studying little worms. Um, the data came from worms, which actually don't have that class of birth defects. And uh, many of the other ones I pointed to um, also came from these surprising connections. So we're taking advantage of these relationships between organisms. All right, so here's your second pop quiz. Keep in your toes. Um, so I said we had 22,000 genes in our DNA, in human DNA. And you know, a little tiny B cell, it's only one cell, it doesn't have blood, it doesn't have you know, hair, or anything like that. What fraction of our genes can we share with a low B cell? Anybody? Any bets? Yeah? I would guess 20%. Yeah. 50% seems a little bit excessive. Yeah. Judging by your presentation, we can probably Okay, alright. Yeah, well argued. Anybody else want to well, take an opposing view? What do you think? Guesses, guesses, guesses. Yeah? 220s? Nobody's going for all. No. All right. Well, clearly it's not all. Yeah. You are actually entirely correct. Um, so, out of our 22,000 genes, about 4,000 of our genes have exactly precise equivalents in a yeast cell. They're, they're recognizable, they're direct, and we, can, we, we know which ones they are. Um, in the plants that I showed you, something like a quarter of our genes have equivalent in plant cells. That's why we could do that trick with the seedling pigmentation. Um, we don't make chlorophyll and all of that, but we actually, evolution reuses parts. And those parts can be sets of genes that work together. It's kind of like if you're building with Legos, you're building out of blocks and you reuse the same blocks lots of times. Or if you're building a, you know, electronics, you reuse the same integrated circuits and transistors in lots of different settings, and evolution does the same thing, and it uses these pre-existing parts. Uh -huh. Is it possible to have no genes in common with another animal or another um, living thing? Um, it's, it is, that's a great question. Um, I don't know of any cases where there's zero genes in common. There's a sort of basic level of there's a basic level of machines that are that are shared across all of life, um, and there's variations in them. But we've never discovered a case that doesn't show that level, basic level of sharing. So you can't say that it's true until you just prove it. Well, you could try. That would be a great uh, task to do. I think it would be tough. Um, and even in mice, you know, seventeen thousand. Okay. So let me take you through kind of a a fun and surprising tour of how we leverage that similarity in a different way from what we just saw. But we're gonna we're gonna sort of 
not just use the molecular data, but we'll use even some more surprising aspects of evolution. Um, now, because of things like a yeast, you know, brewer's yeast and baker's yeast, you can do whatever you want. You can uh, go in and muck with all the genes, and it's, you can grow them and look at them under microscopes and so on. They're easy to work with. So as a consequence, we know a lot about how the genes connect to different traits. You know, hundreds of thousands of those relationships. If you mutate this gene, something happens. Um, that's very different than humans. This was a few years ago. Even now, it's only up to about 5,000 cases. We still have very limited knowledge about all the genetic basis for diseases and traits of the level of the whole person. But we have tons of yeast and worm and mice. We want to try to leverage that in some way. And um, a few years ago, we invented some computer algorithms that go hunting for well, what happens in a yeast cell that predicts a given disease? What happens in a worm that predicts a given human disease? It turns out, because of these sort of shared molecular machines through evolution, we can, we can find crazy predictors. So for example, people um, often take statin drugs for high cholesterol. And certain genes in a yeast, if you, if you mess them up, those yeast just die in the presence of statin drugs. It turns out that those genes are really good predictors of blood vessel genes, genes that are required to make your blood vessels in a human. Um, other genes, um, like in these, farming these first two leaves in the developing plants turn out to really predict human mental retardation genes well. Probably something to do with the structure of the developing embryo. And things like genes involved in the sort of gut wall of a little worm, good predictors of gastrointestinal human genes in people. So there's these sort of crazy relationships. And I'll just I'll show you a couple of them that are that are interesting. Um, the one we understand the best is this. It's that one I mentioned about Statin drugs. People take statins for high cholesterol levels, and I would bet that there's some number of people taking statins in the room uh, right now. One of the most common drugs used. Um, it turns out that in a yeast cell, the genes that, when you mess them up, make the cells not like statins, are many of the same genes that are necessary for making blood vessels. We know this from mice studies and so on. And the way you play this game is you have a set of genes, and the numbers are in these circles um, that are, have you know, this signature property in yeast. And you have a set of genes in the worm, in the mouse case. And we have a bunch of genes that are known in the yeast case, but they've never actually been linked to blood vessels in people and animals. And so those are giving us possible candidates for being important for making blood vessels, which is a critical process for a healthy person. So yeast, obviously, they don't have blood. They don't have blood vessels. How can they tell us anything about making one particular organ in a complex organism like us? So we went into the lab, and we've actually tested all 62 of those genes in different ways. And about eight of them turned out to be right. So it's not 100%, but it was still a fantastically useful thing. And I'll give you an example. And the way we do this is we actually go into a one-day-old um, tadpole, so a little frog in a temple develops very much like a person in the early stages. They make a lot of the same tissues and blood vessels and these sort of things that we do. But they do it in a dish of water and you can look at them under a microscope while it happens, which you would never try to do in a person. And so we can go in and we can see how they work. So here's, this is a picture of a little tadpole that's about two days old. And the head is on the left and the tail is on the right and the back's up there and the tummy's down there. And all that blue stuff is the blood vessels. And we've actually added a dye that selected the blue vessels. This temple over here, we did a trick where we used a particular uh, gene-specific drug that turned off one of the genes that we learned about from yeast. And that little temple doesn't have any blood vessels. It's a veinless frog. So it starts growing up. And as they get a little bit older, we don't let them go very old at all. But as they get a little bit older, they start bleeding when the blood flow starts and so on. So it really is a blood vessel gene. We confirm that. And we can also see that it's not just frogs. It turns out um, from the umbilical cord, you can take it's rich with blood vessels, and you can take some of those cells from the umbilical cord after a birth and you can grow them. And they spontaneously form. These beautiful little filamentous networks. Each of these lines is one cell thick, and they try to self-organize on a dish 
to turn into capillaries. And so this is one of the ways that people study blood vessels in the laboratory, is they take these so-called umbilical vein cells and watch them form in a dish. And we can go in and we can precisely change the human gene. These are human cells. And we can disrupt this process. And we know that this happens in humans as well. Um, so, all right, so what's going on? So the reason all of this works is because, as we said, yeast and people are very, very distant cousins. A long time ago, a million years ago, roughly, there was a common ancestor, and it had a pretty complicated cell, but it had a, a set of genes that worked together, and over many, many generations, in these molecular systems, these gene sets that worked together, were inherited intact as a system. And on each lineage now, the one the lineage that gave rise to people, and the lineage that gave rise to yeast cells, they stayed working together, but they got wired up differently so that they had different things, inputs into the system and different outputs into the system. So the yeast ones now actually talk to forming the walls of the cell, and the human ones now talk to the systems in the embryo to manufacture blood vessels. But it's the same genes, they're still recognizable um, back and forth. It's really remarkable. And what this means is we can look at the system in a yeast cell and we can start to try to develop drugs to affect the blood vessels in people. And this is actually really important for cancer chemotherapy. Um, and so we've done this now where we've actually done drug screens to find drugs that work with this set of genes in a little yeast cell and we're the entire thing is the principle is that we're trying to take advantage of is because we know this is a predictor of blood vessel genes, this could be an angiogenesis inhibitor. We care about angiogenesis inhibitors because this is one of our first line attacks on cancer. Um, many cancers build a tumor fools your body into building new blood vessels. And we try to shut off blood vessel formation in an adult who has a cancer, not in a child, as a way to stop the cancer from feeding itself. So this is a very valuable line of attack on cancers. And in the process of looking at yeast cells, we did find such a drug. And it turned out that there's an FDA-approved drug. It's been used for 40 years in people already. It's got great safety data. And it's an antifungal drug. People have known it for 40 years because it kills fungus. It also has a totally different activity in worms. It's a parasitide. And um, this is what zoos use as a dewormer, an elephant dewormer, basically. Um, but it turns out that activity is the This drug. Um, we discovered now is, um, is a box the blood vessel formation. And I'll show you a picture of how it works um, in a tadpole. Now, this is a special tadpole. Here's the head and the eyes over here, and the tail goes this way. And all the green is that this particular tadpole's blood vessels glow under black light. All right? And it, um, it's a living one, it's just in the dish of water, and we can look at it with time-lapse video in the living animal as its blood vessels grow. So let's see what that looks like. So here on the left is a picture, this is a zoom in, and what you see is all these green lines are blood vessels in a living tadpole. This is over about 20 hours, and they're kind of coursing around as big ones, and there's these little ones growing, and they're starting to connect up. And this is the growth of the healthy blood vessels in the little tadpole. And to test this drug, this drug is actually water soluble. You can just toss it in the dish, and we'll just look at the same thing happening, and let's see what happens. So now they're growing, and then something totally different happens. Now, the blood vessel cells in the animal start to let go of each other and round up. And what this drug does is it actually dissolves tiny blood vessels. Remember, this has been used in people for 40 years but only short-term use. Um, and what we found from looking at a yeast cell is that it actually is capable of dissolving tiny little blood vessels and stopping new ones from growing. It turns out it doesn't dissolve, it doesn't affect the big ones at all. It's only the freshest, newest ones that have been made. And those are the ones that are actually relevant to tumor formation. So we're now, this is already an FDA-approved drug, this actually is now the very first so-called vascular disrupting agent approved for human use. And we're trying to work with a clinical oncologist to get this tested actually for brain cancer because it crosses the blood-brain barrier. And this is an example not of brain cancer, but 
in order to move this into the clinic, we have to demonstrate that it really does stop tumor formation. And so these are some little mice, and these are actually human tumors in them growing. And there's some big ones and the little ones after treating with the drug. And the relevant thing is inside the tumors, all this green is blood vessels. And these guys have much less blood vessels. So this does slow down. It doesn't actually affect the, the tumor cells. It just slows down their growth by cutting off their food supply. All right. So this is sort of crazy, right? Because we can start off with genes, in this case from a mouse. They were known to be involved in blood vessel formation. We can go hunting for a system and yeast cells that relate to those. And that gives us new genes to make blood vessels in an animal, which we can test in a frog. And that tells us that the yeast was useful, so we can do drug screens in the yeast to find drugs tested in a frog that we're now moving into the clinic. Um, and all of this works because this system is shared between all of these um, living creatures. This is an example of a very, very deep ancient system that goes back a billion years. All right, um, I'll give you sort of one more example. This one's a much quicker one, just to kind of make this point. These things can be very non-obvious, because you don't, you think about when you see a plant or something like that, you, you perceive the external differences, and you forget about the, the very deep connections at a molecular level that we have. Um, this was a fun and also crazy one that came out of these studies. It turns out that plants you know, sense gravity. Plants have all sorts of superpowers. And one of those is that they grow up, and they grow down in response to gravity. The roots go down and the shoots go up. And that's because they have gravity sensors in their cells. And when you break those gravity sensors, and you turn a plant on its side, normally they would keep growing up. But some genes are critical for that, and if you break those genes in the way I described, then they just keep growing sideways. And those genes actually turn out to predict human deafness genes. And again, it's just a few genes. We know five genes that have this property in plants. And two of those are affiliated with a particular form of deafness in people that causes a few percent of human deafness. And it's something called Wardenberg syndrome. So Wardenberg syndrome um, uh, 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 sufferers have um, sort of a few characteristics to point out. So here's a, a few of them here. And you notice that this young lady has different colored eyes. And um, all of these um, people here have white forelock of hair. And um, sometimes there can be changes to the shape of the head and so on. And all of them are, are deaf. As I said, this causes a few percent of human deafness cases. Um, so we have a prediction from a plant of three new deafness genes. And we can go into the lab and try to understand if this is true or not. And to do that, I just have to tell you what Wordberg syndrome is. And the reason that um, Wardenberg syndrome patients have the difficult eyes and so on, and the deafness, is that these traits are actually linked as an embryo when you're developing. They all come from sort of an old diagram of an embryo developing, and these big stripes are cells that start off on the back, and they, they, they swim down through the rest of the cells. So in the embryo, these cells are moving against all the other cells, and eventually they set up the craniofacial bones and the otolith in the ear, and they set up all the pigmented cells. And so anything that messes up these cells, which are called neural crest cells, changes all of these traits simultaneously. So here's an example in dogs. Dogs are bred to be black and white. You know, Dalmatians are bred to be black and white. Very, very hard breeding on the coloration. They are also 22% unilaterally deaf. The deafness comes along for the run. If you breed for pigmentation, you affect the, the uh, hearing in the process. And there's lots of other classic examples. It's Darwin Day. So Darwin had an association in 1859 between blue-eyed cats, white blue-eyed cats, and deafness. And this is also an effect of the same cells. So we could ask if these genes affected those cells. And just to sort of cut to the chase, the, the answer is yes. These are just to give you the basic idea of how we do these tests. These are very, very early one-day-old tadpoles, and the blue is the these cells moving down to the embryo, and we can turn off the gene in just one side of the animal, but not the other, and compare the two sides. And on this side, we don't get this activity. So these are genes for the systems that we know are important for Wardenberg syndrome. We haven't actually checked in people yet. We want to to see if these genes are involved um, there, but there's every reason to think they should be. Okay.
So, so what have we got? We've got people with word word syndrome gives us a system of plants, crazy as it is, it makes a concrete prediction that we can test in a frog, and the next step now is to confirm the people. And the reason we can do this is this is again an ancient system, a billion and a half years old roughly, that uh, um, was inherited by both plants and people. Okay, so I'll just give you um, a couple of slides and then wrap up, I think it's getting late. Um, just to really make the point, we're using this knowledge of this ancient equivalence back and forth all the time. But it's actually much stronger than that. We can literally take the DNA for these ancient systems. We can take the DNA from a person and we can give it to a yeast cell and it will support the growth of the yeast cell. If we get rid of the right DNA in the yeast cell, they'll die. And if we give them the matching piece from a human, they will then live using the DNA of a human in substituting for the DNA of the yeast. And these are some cases. We've now tested this about 500 different times different genes, these are two different genes, and the cells, these are petri dishes with yeast cells on them, and these guys have the yeast gene turned off and they die without the human gene, and these guys grow with it on there. So it's really quite remarkable. There's a sort of very deep connection there that we can do these sort of tests. Okay, so um, what's this good for? Well, I'm mean, certainly interesting. Uh, good for dinner conversation. Um, or not. Um, <laughs> my dinner might be dinner. Um, but actually, we started talking about human genetic variation. These now give us living test tubes to study all the human genetic variants. So what we and other groups around the world are now doing is putting all the human mutations in human genes into yeast cells, and the yeast grow differently if it's a healthy version of a gene. So these are sectors in one of these petri dishes. You can see these guys aren't growing very well. That's actually a disease-causing variant, and this is a common variant that doesn't cause disease, and we can see that right from the growth assays. So these are giving us living test tubes to study which changes among people are, make a difference and not, at least for these genes that are shared. All right, we need to name these Saccharomyces sapiens, just to be, <laughs> I don't know, they have a sense of humor about these things, I guess. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and end here. Um, I'll just point out that this is, um, you know, it's, it's wonderful to come here and, and see all the events here uh, about celebrating Darwin and evolution and so on. Uh, these are, this theory now and, and all of the follow-up theories over the years now are basically our bread and butter. We use these all the time to try to discover new drugs and genetic basis of disease. Um, and I think that they're, you know, they really inform many aspects of our life. Um, and I also think it's great that we have so many events for kids here and so on. This is something that you learn early on. I just, I'll leave you with this napkin that my daughter sitting here drew uh, when she was five years old. And again, this was a dinner table conversation mm -hmm. of the tree of life. Um, we had all the pairs, mouse and rat, cat, lion, horses and donkeys, uh, toads, frogs, chimps, monkeys, elephants, woolly mammoths, and apparently dad is related to woolly <laughs> mammoths. I haven't quite figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'll stop there and take a question.
drug screens on the fly to try to figure out which drug cocktail might be useful for your cancer. I think there's a lot of, you know, it's very early days, but there's a lot of legs. The technology is all converging in an exciting way. So, uh huh? You don't have a question, I don't believe. Um, you keep saying that you just put so and so gene into the yeast or something. You make it sound easy. It's yeah. It is actually easy. Is <laughs> we do it lots of different ways. Well, but it took a long time to develop Oh, it took, yeah, decades to develop the technology, but now it's easy. So the, the basic idea is you have to you have to break open the cell in such a way that you can it's leaky and you can put molecules into it but it doesn't die and you have to let it reseal after that. So there's a lot of tricks in adding stuff to it and so on to make it a little bit leaky and then you literally give it a piece of DNA and we can just manufacture DNA. We have machines that will just spit out a little tube. Machines, you mean molecular? No, no. I mean literally we have a machine in the lab. How big? This big. And it'll actually manufacture any custom DNA sequence you want. You can order it through the web. Um, if you go up on the web, you can order any arbitrary uh, sequence of DNA. Uh, you want a thousand, a thousand bases that says your name in DNA code, you can order that. They'll ship it to you. Um, it's not very expensive. And you can put that on the cells, and when you make them a little bit leaky, the DNA zips in, and you close them up again in the heel, and then they have that DNA. Now the trick is what, what you give them. You have to be careful about the DNA has a grammar, just like English or any other language has a grammar of punctuation and things like that. And you have to write the right thing in the DNA. But you know, that's the science. But that's it's some, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. We'll get a few more people and we'll loop back around. So this research has enormous social implications. <laughs> I didn't even start with this stuff. <laughs> do, you, do you and your, and your uh, fellow scientists ever keep around the social implications? Oh, absolutely. Or are you only no, no, no. We're extremely conscious of all of this. And in fact, you know, the Human Genome Project itself had an entire section called ELSI, Ethical and Social Implications. Uh, and, and there's many projects that scientists have taken active moratoriums that decided that there's certain aspects, human cloning is one of these, that decided there's a moratorium that will not be done. Um, that, uh, that said, uh, you know, working with yeast cells, one of the reasons that we like to use these with other organisms is because we feel we're in much safer ethical territory than if we were doing this in human babies or something like that, obviously. And so we, we're trying to leverage you know, sort of all the history of brewing and things like that to take advantage of the simplicity and ease and safety of these systems to learn about us and transfer that information. So we're, we're extremely conscious of these aspects, uh, always. Yeah. So I, I'm back to the leaking cells. Once you uh, make the cell leaking and you get in there, how, what about the nuclear envelope? Yeah. So. Um, the process that makes the cell leaky um, is enough to get it in, and, and it, it seems to get zipped up inside the nucleus without a, without a problem. Um, you can do different tricks. One of the tricks is you can zap them with electricity, and then just sort of it blows holes and zips right in. You know, the old classic way in plants is they would have a shotgun with gold-coated beads um, with DNA on the outside, and they would just fire it into the leaves and some of those would end up in the cell, and the cell would heal and grow, and they would then have the DNA. Uh, so, you know, a lot of the plant labs would literally have a shotgun with a petri dish at the bottom, kind of <laughs> set up in the laboratory. <laughs> a gene gun. <laughs> yes, over here. How are you feeling about GMOs with all this commonality? Yeah. So, um, I have maybe an atypical stance on GMOs. I you know, working as a geneticist and understanding what's being done and how it relates to traditional breeding, um, I'm actually extremely comfortable with the technology. Now, there are instances where particular plants, Monsanto hasn't done anybody any favors, there's particular plants that you might argue that's not a good idea, but the technology itself, I actually feel, is an incredibly powerful technology with a great capacity for good. And things like golden rice, to try to cure vitamin A deficits uh, in the third world with uh, you know, rice flight, um, fight these sort of things. I think it has a tremendous capacity for good and I think it's an extraordinarily safe technology. So this is, you know, there's a, many people who feel very strongly about this. 
I'm sort of at the extreme far end of the spectrum um, in terms of I, I see it's a tremendous upside um, if the regulatory hurdles can be overcome. So, yeah. So it sounds like you don't control where the, this new DNA uh, piece is spliced into the code in the cell. Does it control it, or does it not matter where it goes? No, no. Um, we, we can control um, down to the precise space. So in the human genome and the yeast genome, we can, we can state exactly with one base precision where the DNA goes and what the change is, which is you know, remarkable. That's the, the degree to which the technology has changed just over the last decade. It used to be a much more random process, and now it's extreme precision. There's a new technology called CRISPR. This was a big breakthrough technology that now, um, in virtually any organism, we can make any precision change at, at the exact position you choose and exactly what the change is. Uh, where do you expect this to be in the future, five, ten years, whatever you want to say, and what are you hopeful about it in the future? Well, so I, I think that. There's, there's a few directions that I think are really interesting and important. One of them is the personal medicine. Um, so we talked about cancer or the monolithic disease, but actually every cancer is a little bit different. And the individual genetics have huge consequences. So understanding how you know, your individual genetics affects your disease, I think, is one of the certainly most promising areas. And these kinds of technologies and the other technologies we're talking about have a great deal to offer there. Um, even just learning which genes are affiliated with which diseases gets us into a prospect of being able to do drug discovery and, and improve medicine on those. Uh, agriculture, if we can get around sort of the regulatory body and, and, and uh, uh, in the sense of um, finding sort of safe ways to introduce these new technologies that people are comfortable with, I think have a tremendous positive potential for impacting, you know, uh, um, uh, food scarcity in the world. So I think these are some of the big areas. Um, yes? Like speaking on the personal medicine, does this mean that it can help theoretically um, diseases such as genetic thyroid disorders or other such genetic diseases right. could be severely reduced? Yeah, so the state of the art right now is that we can often figure out what's broken but we can't fix it. And I expect this to persist a while. There's going to be a time in which we can look at your, G your DNA and we can say, oh, you, know, you clearly have something wrong with that, but we don't have a drug that will attack it. You know, this, is, this is pretty much the, what's happening right now for a lot of cancers and other genetic disorders. But you have to look at this as a temporary time, that as we're learning how to um, make more personalized drugs and that sort of thing, and we hope that after diagnosing it, you know, 10 years down the line, we'll be in more in better capacity to address these things. So, in other words... <laughs> be patient, in other words. <laughs> so, and science moves incredibly fast and incredibly slowly at the same time. So, yes, go ahead. Right, so that's the whole key. We can read the DNA in a natural organism, and we can go through and we can do lots of experiments in the lab where we just take a little piece of it and we test it to see if it does the thing we're interested in. Yeah. So we can take your whole genome and we can whittle it down to these 500 letters we know are important, and then maybe that's the 500 letters you make. Or, and we understand a lot of rules. Yeah, so, so, um, the big breakthrough in the recently is that now we can read the DNA of any organism, and we can read your DNA um, in the, inside of a week. Now we could have your entire DNA written down. It would be a really long book, three billion letters, but we could actually write it down and sequence it. And because of that, we can now compare it across individuals and figure out which bits are important. And this helps us, guides us in knowing what to make. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, I'm around a little bit. You're welcome to come up and ask more questions. Uh.